Welcome to Podcast on Tech Nation. This is a series of podcasts focused specifically on the biomedical and HTM industry. Episodes will be added monthly. Listening to each episode is eligible for one CE credit from the ACI. At the conclusion of this episode, you'll be able to access a survey that will appear under this episode's title. You will be able to download your certificate once you submit the survey. Before we begin today's podcast, I'd like to invite you to our Spring MD Expo. We will be in Las Vegas from April the 7th to 9th. So for more information and event details, please visit mdexposhow.com. Podcast on Tech Nation would like to thank our sponsor, Multi Medical Systems. When you're in the business of protecting the health of patients, you don't have time for malfunctioning medical equipment or dull surgical instruments. You need a reliable partner that can provide expert repair and planned maintenance to ensure you have patient ready equipment that meets or exceeds OEM guidelines, lines, and regulatory requirements. Multimedical Systems provides these crucial elements and others such as on-demand temporary biomedical staffing, endoscope and surgical repairs, infusion pump preventative maintenance teams and equipment sales. For more information, please visit multimedicalsystems.com. In this episode, we are joined by Heidi Horn, President at Heidi Horn HTM Consulting. Welcome back to HTM Insider. I'm Sherelle with Multimedical Systems, your host. And we're back again with another topic that I think needs some attention. I'm so excited to have Heidi on today. With Heidi Horn has been in the industry for quite a long time and she's also working with Amy. And we're gonna kind of explore standardizations in the HTM industry. So Heidi, thank you for coming on. And why don't you introduce yourself and kind of your background to our guest. Yeah, well, thank you for having me, Sherelle. It's been uh, it's an honor to be joining the show, and uh, I really get a kick out of talking to you and, and all our HTM friends out there. So, yeah, as you mentioned, this is a uh, hot topic, and we'll get to it. But uh, just a quick background for those of you I have not met and hopefully we'll meet soon. Uh, my name is Heidi Horn, and I'm the president of Heidi Horn HTM Consulting, which is a consulting company I started um, back in May. Uh, prior to that, though, I do have over, you know, I keep saying over 20 years, but I hate to admit it's now 25 plus years of experience in the HTM world. Um, I ran my uh, a fairly large HTM organization for a um, large health system. I had 22 hospitals, about 120 technicians reporting up to me and did that for, um, you know, like I said, I was in there for decades uh, working with that area. For the past four years prior to becoming, um, joining or starting my own firm, I actually worked for a company called Nuvolo, which is a CMMS provider. And uh, that's where I think, and we'll talk a little bit about this, I'm sure, where the um, it really became clear to me working with all the dozens and dozens of clients across the United States, how unique and different all HTM organizations are and how they all see themselves as having best practices and um, everybody thinks that their way is the best way. But uh, it really does create a lot of, um, quite frankly, extra work and, and, and not, uh, you know, unfortunately, not everybody's quote, best practice is a best practice. So so we'll talk about that. But yeah, so that's my background. I'm also, you mentioned, um, I'm on the Amy board. I've been with Amy since 2005, actually. And uh, I'm on uh, the treasurer of the uh, on executive committee of the Amy board. And so uh, that's a, a wonderful organization. Um, and I have utmost, utmost respect for all those folks there. And one of the things, as you know, that Amy does is it provides standards and guidelines and everything else. And so, again, it was through that work with Amy that I really started to appreciate the need um, and what standards brings to organizations. So. Now, I know there's a lot being talked about mm -hmm. out there, social media and, and other periodicals. Standardization in exactly what are we going to talk about today? Because there's a different... So I guess the area that most interests me, I, I'm looking for the low-hanging fruit. <laughs> and uh, I know some people want like, well, let's standardize 
on how we do every, you know, PM or this, that, or the other. We're not talking about that. That's not, um, to me, that's a little bit more complicated, quite frankly, because all repairs and all maintenance needs are a little bit different. And so to come up with a standardized practice for how to approach something like that is going to take, you know, I'm not saying it wouldn't be possible, but it would require a lot more work. What I'm really interested in are those areas, and we might not even realize it, that um, that we are all doing things differently that don't make a whole lot of sense. For example, um, you know, again, being with the, the in the CMMS world, I realized that everybody had different work order codes. You know, some people call it corrective maintenance. Some people call it repair. Some people call it this or the other. But even within those, they would have different type of things and different failure codes. Um, and so everybody's using different data points. Um, they're, you know, again, the response code, all those, just the codes themselves, everyone's calling it something different. They're tracking the data differently. And those are the things that make no sense to me whatsoever. Um, because again, you know, those are things that we can standardize on. And if you think about the amount of time it takes to configure a CMMS to be specific to your department's unique needs, that's extra cost, it's extra time. And I will tell you, it's very, very hard for these all CMMS companies to support them. Um, because again, when you're calling and you say, I have a problem because my repair codes aren't working or whatever it might be, you're completely different than everybody else. So that's just one example. Um, things like, you know, again, joint commission is and uh, CMS, DMV, they're all very, very vague in their regulations. However, um, how so how we, we interpret those as an or, as an industry uh, also are, are very different and variable. And things like, you know, I just wrote this down because I wanted to make sure I got the wording correctly. There's um so CMS says you have to um, provide PMs on devices that are new equipment with a sufficient amount of maintenance history. That's exact words. So new equipment with sufficient amount. So, but what is sufficient? You know, what, what does that mean? Some people say, well, if I've had it a week, it's sufficient. If I've had it two years, it's sufficient. Um, again, everybody is interpreting that differently. And so uh, how their policies and procedures play out and how they are, you know, operating is very, very different. So those are just some examples um, of, of things that I think are what I call low hanging fruit that we should be able to agree on. Um, case in point, you know, and this just drives me nuts sometimes. Is it plan maintenance, preventive maintenance or preventative maintenance? And, and you see all over the place, like, can we just agree that this is what we call it? And, uh, and be, and be, you know, uh, you know, consistent on it. So th those are, well, so when we talk about standards, you know, and even our name, HTM, are we HTM? Are we clinical engineering? Are we, you know, biomed, what, whatever. So we can't even agree on that. So it's just, it's, it's, um, I think we've come to a point in time where having being unique and different, it, it was used to be part of our DNA. We had this get her done attitude and you, you, don't really worry about the procedures, you know, necessarily the policy all the time. You go get it done. You fix the equipment as fast as you can. But those days, quite frankly, of not having any of those standardized best practices, really identifying what the best practices are and agreeing to them and practicing them are, are over because we now need, you know, we need data to compare ourselves to each other. We need to be able to show that we're doing a good job. We need to be able to, you can't, if you, if you don't, um, if you can't compare yourself to other organizations, how can you say you're the best of the best? Or how can you even say you're doing an adequate job? How can you tell your C-suite you're doing a pretty good job? You can't because you can't compare it. So anyway, you can see I'm very passionate about this. <laughs> I love it though. I love it. So how are you, at Amy, let's just say Amy's working on this initiative to gather these people, and there's a lot of people to gather. Yeah. And how are you going to standardize that across the board with so many, I'm going to say, whether it's an ISO to a large in-house mm -hmm. program, 
I didn't get all those meetings of the minds to happen to see who has the best terminology to right. adapt it and enforce it. Right. Well, it takes um, it takes people. And so that is the big thing right now is Amy has, um, I'll use on, on the sterilization side of um, Amy, they have some wonderful standards and, and these OEMs have come, sterilization OEMs have come together and agreed on, you know, these are the best sterilization practices. These are the best things to do. And, and it makes a lot of sense for them, you know, and so that, again, they can ensure that the um, sterilization equipment they're building matches up with what those um, best practices are and, and they're agreeing on that. Where we've always struggled in HTM, though, is the coming together part. And, and so what, you know, this is kind of a first thing um, that we're, you know, when I, and I say we, we, uh, Amy, but also other, you know, other organizations, ACCE and others, you know, have kind of come to the point where I think we agree as an industry, um, we need to start looking at this a little bit more. So the first step is really just be, make people aware. I think when you say standards, everyone out there thinks, oh my goodness, one, it's, um, those are rules. We don't like rules that we have to follow. Uh, and, and, and those rules will be more costly and they will slow us down. And if done properly, that's actually the opposite will occur. Um, if you, if you create and identify best practices and turn them into standards, then you know, you're not reinventing the wheel every time. You're not going out and saying, okay, you know, what, what do I, they've, they've come up with this AEM thing. Now I got to manage it. How do I, what do I do with that? What are the steps I have to take? And as you know, we've, we've come up with, um, Amy has put out some guidebooks on AEM. But I will tell you, and I know this um, just talking to people in the industry, not many people are following it to the letter. They're still trying to reinvent the wheel. So they're creating more work, more variation, and ultimately more opportunities to, um, you know, fail and, and create errors. So when you ask, you know, what, how do you do that? You get people to aware, but we are going to need people to participate. And that's been the struggle all along is getting people to participate in those standards committees. Um, cause they take a long time. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it. It is, uh, it is, you know, I, I worked when I was with the technology management council, I, I chaired the technology management management council a few years ago with Amy and we created this plan maintenance definitions guide. And that was just a guidebook, a very short 12 page, I believe guidebook that took us months to get through. So if, when you're creating standards, it can take a long time. Um, but that's not to say just because it's hard, you shouldn't do it. And ultimately if you can get people to participate and be part of the process and again, buy into, you know, identify those best practices, um, the end product will be everybody saving more time, doing things better, raising the bar, you know, the whole industry will improve with that. So I think that it would make everyone speaking the same language. Right. And, you know, we know that we're lacking in biomeds in this industry. And I, mm -hmm. and I think that would level the playing field for new people coming in to understand the language and the codes are, across the board. I mean, it makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. It does. And, and for a health, healthcare in general actually does tend to be very, uh, you know, we're all unique and different. You know, they, they view themselves. We are, we're a children's hospital. We're a, you know, rural hospital. We're a urban center, whatever it might be. Everybody looks at that they're unique and different. Um, and in some cases they are, but the vast majority of what they do is the same. They're just working with the same equipment um, and it's supposed to be doing the same thing and they're supposed to maintain it, you know, in a certain way, um, following the same regulations. And so it's trying to wrap your head around those things that where we are the same and can be the same or should be the same um, and not get as hung up on those things that maybe we should continue to be unique and different on because there are going to be those variations that you, you, you have to, you know, because again, there's nothing, um, not everything is the same in healthcare. So I think if we can focus on those areas that we are, um, have those opportunities there, we can really drive and move forward this industry. 
I, I really did as far as, you know, the safe and reliability, reliable um, use and uh, the equipment. So. And I would think that you'd want the OEMs somehow integrated into this process, wouldn't you? Uh, OEMs, ISOs, everyone. So that's another, okay. So again, you get, uh, you know, we always refer to HTM as it's the in-house organization, but OEMs have HTM organizations. They have a service arm. They have service technicians that provide service on medical equipment. Those are, that's HTM. ISO is the same thing. Um, so we are all, you know, I think when we s- stop kind of saying they're different from us and they're different from us and they're different from us. Um, and again, look at there are differences, no doubt about it, but we're all again, working on the same equipment. Um, if we all have safety, reliability, cost savings, regulatory compliance, top of mind, then, you know, we can find some uh, common ground. And, and there's, yes. So, yes, they have to be involved. They should be involved. ISO should be involved. Um, anyone who maintains equipment um, and uh, should be involved. So, I should say. You need a big room for a lot of people. Yeah, I should say everyone, yes. But we need some select. We need a, um, obviously, a representative um, from all those areas. Yeah, I I could see that you would. Um, what what would be like a date that you're looking at? Is there a year projected? Oh no, I, no no no. Uh, I mean honestly, the, so there have been you know years of there's been different standards that have been created around medical equipment maintenance um, by Amy, but I think everybody will agree that they're they're pretty loose still you know when I or and vague. Um, and, and there's still some opportunities for improvement. And so, so it's not like this, we're just starting this. I mean, the, the, this has been a journey, but I think what has happened up until recent years, there has been a major pushback from the HCM folks to even think about or consider um, more standards and more standardization, uh, mainly because we, we don't have, you know, we haven't had the ability to really to get into a room and uh, start talking about it as a representative group. Um, and then even when that group agrees, you know, then you kind of push it out to the industry and the industry is like, eh, not going to do it, not going to do it. So, you know, then that's when you start having, okay, you create good standards that are based on real world. So that's important. You know, they have to be real world um, and the organizations have to have the ability to, implement them and those implementing them will create a, a safer, better, more cost-effective environment. Um, and if that's the case, then we would hope that CMS, Joint Commission, DNV then um, can adopt them as their own standards. And so rather than having CMS, you know, so that the, the tail wagging the dog thing, I think has happened in the past. CMS um, and then Joint Commission has come back out and said, well, you need to do this. You need to do that. And they're, and I'll be very honest, and I'll say this now because I'm not part of a health system and I won't, don't worry about them showing up at my door yelling at me. Um, but they're, they're very vague. And, and, and they, I think in some cases were obviously not written by anybody who has ever maintained equipment. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I mean, that's, it's terrible to say, but, um, they're not based in real world how things are done. Um, you know, in a, in a hospital setting. And so what happens, you know, I'll use the hundred percent PM completion thing, which again is another sore point for me. Um, but it's like, it's impossible to be, to complete a hundred percent of all your PMs on time every single time. It's impossible because you have equipment that gets lost. You have equipment that, that is in use. Um, you know, you have equipment that is waiting for a part from a vendor, all these different reasons. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, making 100% completion a regulation forces the organ, forces HTM organizations essentially to lie because they're not completing them. Um, what they're doing is that they're closing the work order out, but that is not complete. That's, that's a great point, Heidi. That's a great point. Yeah. What do you think that the HTM industry is going to say about the cost that would be incurred 
by each organization to make those changes. I feel like that might be something that might be brought up. Yes. Um, so again, the costs, you know, I, I couldn't even begin to say what they might be, but they will, you know, they will, if, if there's a standardized processes that are pushed out, like anything, like, again, like uh, the, uh, whenever there's new regulations, you know, the, the hospitals have to run around and the OEMs and the ISOs have to figure out, okay, how are we going to adhere to these? Um, and there are costs involved with changing their policies and procedures to adhere to the new regulations and new requirements. Uh, that's what this would instill. But ultimately, the hope is that there will actually be cost savings because you're not spending so much time independently of each other trying to figure out how now to, you know, adhere to these new, these changes. It, it would be a collective standard, essentially. Um, well, especially the different CMMS programs, if everyone made the same changes, it wouldn't be an individual change. It would be a system change if everybody went to it at the same time. I think that would be beneficial. Right. And, and well, Novolo, like everybody who was on Novolo as their CMMS program all made the changes at the same time, then maybe it would be a collective cost than an individual cost. Right. So, okay, we'll use the CMMS example, um, which is a good example. I would put it if if all HEM organizations could agree that these are going to be their work order codes. These are our, you know, we're going to use corrective maintenance, plan maintenance, support services. You know, I'm just kind of rattling some off. I, um, I initial inspection, all of those, uh, whatever they might be, whatever the whatever Amy guidebook says they should be. Um, then, and these are going to be all our failure codes. Then all CMMS companies can then configure their CMMS to the, that is the out of the box configuration for everything. And, and again, it's, it makes it that much easier if you think about how much time you have to spend um, cleaning up the data to go into, you know, a, a new CMMS, everything would be ready to go, ready, um, you know, from that perspective. So, so those are, so ultimately the hope would be that it's going to save you time um, and money and effort because again, everything else will be set up accordingly and, and um, you can make those changes, if that makes sense. Yeah, 100%. I really like the thought that PM is defined. Mm -hmm. Right. But, well, that's a simple one. That should be a, a good one to start with, I would it think. That's a good one to start with, exactly. Um, and, and there we have you know, so many different cases of that in the industry uh, that people are doing things differently. Um, you know, when do you call it, if you're looking for a device, let's say, uh, for its PM and you can't find it, how many times should we look for it before we decide it's no longer in the building? Again, every organization does it very, very differently. Some decide we're just going to keep looking for it. Every six months, we're going to go out and look for this device. And if you multiply that by the hundreds hundreds of you know devices that they have they can't find, that is a lot of time. Or some might say, we're just going to look for it once, and then we're closing it out as the device is retired. But there's, the, again, there's a whole variation in there. Um, and who's right, who's wrong, and you know, what's the best way? I don't. I find it hard to believe that that is driven so much by the type of organization it is. You know what I'm saying? That should be, we should be able to agree on that. You know, you look for it twice. You can't find it. You assume that the device is retired. And, and market as such. Those are, that's a simple one. That's a simple one. And you know, I came across something last week that invoked this conversation about operational verification checks and mm -hmm. electrical safeties. Right. And there was four different opinions. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. I'm like, can we just pick one? Right. Right. And we're just trying to get the job done. And, yeah. and mm -hmm. do you want it to be electrical safety checked? Mm -hmm. And, you know, do an operational verification. Do you want one or the other? It right. took like several people to get involved in the conversation to figure mm -hmm. that out. And that should be standardized. And, right. And there's no reason why it shouldn't be. And again, um, it's, it's, it's because the, the industry has been left, um, you know, and it's done a good job so far, but everybody's operating, you know, in their own little bubble 
Um, and then they decide, well, the way I'm doing it is the best way to do it, you know, because I'm doing it that way. So, but that obviously cannot be the case. Everybody can't be the best way to do it. So what, what ultimately, you know, you're looking at is, um, what makes the most sense to ensure the safety and reliability of that equipment um, at the lowest cost and least amount of effort. And, and you know, that's, that's a very simple way of putting it, but you know, you never want to hinder the safety and reliability equipment. But if you're going too far and you're spending too much time doing unnecessary work, in some ways one could say you're actually taking away from the time that people could be spending doing um, life-saving type of work, you know, so you're spent, you're wasting your time doing things where you should be spending it doing other things over here that right. actually have an impact. And that's a cost savings, right? Right. You right. know, another thing I think might be great to see standardized at some point is inventories. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of inventories and there are just <laughs> the amount of unnecessary information, necessary information, things that are completely missing mm -hmm. that you have to ask for, even an inventory. When was the last PM? Right. You get it in several different ways. Right. Yeah. So I could see that would be beneficial in standardizing, you know, how everyone has their inventory listed, but it goes back to your CMS program because that's where it comes from, right? right? Right. But again, if there's, if there's standards, so I was, I think I was explaining before, it's like, it's the tail wagging the dog or the dog wagging the tail. If um, we as HTM professionals can develop those standards based on you know real world um, experience and data and analytics and everything else that you know and doing this in a way that makes a lot of sense and then have you know the regulatory agencies the CMS the DMVs the uh, Joint Commission um, adopt those as standards rather than vice versa, you know, rather than them pushing it down and us adopting something that was not really, you know, um, based in real world, then I think it makes a lot more sense um, and something that will be more practical for all HTMers. And the same goes with the CMMS piece, is if, if the HTM professionals are driving the standards um, versus the CMMS companies, you know, because I can tell you most CMMS companies, uh, you know, not all, but most don't have a lot of people in there who know HDM. They have engineers and they have you know, uh, architects. And, and so those folks don't know the industry. And so they're creating software based on their limited knowledge of how, how it actually works in, in, again in the real world. So have, is there a committee yet? Is there a place where people might that might be leaders in this industry? can get right. a hold of you or to Amy to get to volunteer their time? Yeah. So um, at, at this point, the answer is no. Um, and so Amy, you know, being like any organization and all of us, we have, you know, limited resources and limited um, amount of, uh, you know, folks that can work on these things. However, I think the, the first step is, you know, we're trying to get the word out and get people to understand and at least get acclimated to the concept of, um, because it, it is a foreign concept, I think, for most HDM organizations. And again, I'm talking about the OEMs, the ISOs, and the in-house organizations um, to appreciate. But then, you know, we at Amy then will, um, you know, start collecting interest. Like which, which, cause, because we can't do it all at the same time. You know, you have to, you have to prioritize and pick and choose. So which standards should we be working on um, to make the most sense? And then, you know, we start putting those into a, um, you know, a, a, um, a plan, creating a plan for them and then creating committees and looking for volunteers. So, you know, this is really at the point where we're, um, I want to get people excited about volunteering and uh, thinking about it and understanding how extremely important it is and how much this work, you know, will mean to the industry as a whole. And then um, there will definitely be things coming out from Amy in the future about it and, and, you know, what, uh, how people can get involved and, and, you know, it might not be just being on a committee. It might just be providing feedback to particular standards or draft standards or things like that. So there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, and so I'm excited about that. So if there's somebody who is as passionate about 
standardization as you are. Yes. Can they send you an email and reach out That's to you, right Heidi? There. Yeah, I think that would be a good way to start. And I don't want to, you know, I, I definitely want to make sure that um, people do reach out. So you can reach me um, on my email, which is pretty easy. It's Heidi.horn, H-O-R-N, at HeidiHorn.com. So, uh, yeah, you can uh, you can find me pretty easily in that way. And then we'll start collecting some names. And like I said, um, this is going to be a multi-year process. So this isn't going to come out right away. Um, first step is just to make sure that, as you mentioned before, uh, you couldn't get everybody to agree, even that there is a need to agree. And so I think we need to first... We have, you know, first step, except you have a problem. <laughs> we have a problem. And so uh, then get everybody to like, okay, we got a, we, admit we got a problem. So this is how we're going to work our way through it to, as an industry, start, you know, working on the low hanging fruit of things that we can start agreeing on, which there are many things. I think it's a great idea. And I believe standardization will benefit everyone in time saving, cost savings, and just making the industry more standard in general. So all the new people that we're attracting to the industry, it's not, well, over here we call it this, and over there you call it that, and you do it like this here, but not like this there. And I think standards are good for the industry in general. Mm -hmm. So um, I got to ask you, so we always close every episode with a wow, your words with of wisdom. Wow. Words yeah, we like <laughs> We'd like to hear from you, Heidi, and just to leave the listeners and viewers with something. Um, it's been a great episode, and I want to give you a little time just to close it up for us. Okay. Well, um, so I don't know how uh, words of wisdom, but, um, you know, we, we do pride ourselves in HTM about how, you know, and, and quite frankly, we know our, our – um, we're all aging in it. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's an aging uh, industry. And I think that's all of the average age is like 55 plus right now. Um, however, you know, I would just remind everybody we're not dogs and we can learn new tricks. And so my, I guess, uh, words of wisdom for the HGM industry is that, you know, always be curious, always want to learn new things always want to make sure that you're educating yourselves on the latest and best and uh, greatest in the industry. Um, and standardization and standards is one of those new tricks that I think we can learn. And so that would be my words of wisdom is uh, don't be a dog. <laughs> I like it. And some of us older dogs can learn new tricks. We can learn new tricks. Model, right. <laughs> right. I learned Excel. So if I got Excel. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right. Okay, Heidi, it's been great having you on today. And we appreciate your time. We know you're busy um, to come on and share a little bit about standardizations with the HTM community and where it might be headed. I think it's going to be really intriguing for our viewers and listeners to tune in and, and see where the industry might be going. Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, look forward to talking to everybody and anybody who is interested in and getting on, uh, you know, finding out about how getting involved. And we'll certainly um, keep everybody up to date on that. And thank you again, Cheryl, for having me on your show. Um, it's been fun. So. Thank you, Heidi. Now, you know, you can find HTM Insider any place you listen to your podcast. You can also listen through Tech Nation. And when you log on to listen there, if you need the CE credits, you get one CE for listening to this podcast today. Thank you for following HTM Insider. And, uh, you all have a great day. Thank you, Heidi, for a great presentation. If you enjoyed today's episode, you might enjoy our ongoing webinar series, Webinar Wednesday. You can find a calendar of upcoming live webinars, as well as an archive of on-demand webinars at webinarwednesday.live. To obtain your certificate for one CE credit from the ACI, please remember to complete and submit the survey form lo located below this podcast title. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com.